Right, so, uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm Mike, G0MJW, and the plan today is to talk about propagation that you can't, uh, propagation you can't rely on, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, but it's really to do with what matters to us amateurs. Um, we like to push the boundaries of things. We prefer uh, to do stuff that is different, work DX. Professional radio engineers are interested in stuff that works. Um, so amateurs generally want to use modes that aren't really any use to the professionals. Quite often they're modes that cause interference. So um, things like ducting that you used to get on analogue television a few years ago when we used to have analogue television um, and we used to have DX. Um, I'm a pain in the neck basically for broadcasters because they're causing all sorts of interference problems. So that's really what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about things that professionals aren't so interested in. I'm going to say a bit more about a few models. Um, I'll look at some of the mechanisms and I'm going to try and go back to the basics. Um, I know it's after lunch, so if I see anyone falling asleep, I'll shout and hopefully wake you all up again. Uh, but if you do find anything I've said too difficult to understand, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and uh, ask for a bit more clarification or a bit more uh, information. So, Maxwell's equations. <laughs> Not going to go there, so don't worry about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, but I will say a little bit about the thing we call the plane wave. Uh, we can get a long way without worrying about Maxwell's equations. Uh, but the things to remember is that the so an electromagnetic wave contains an electric field and a magnetic field, hence the name. Uh, those are orthogonal to each other, they're 90 degrees to each other. Um, polarisation is defined by the direction that the electric field is varying. Um, the wavelength is the distance that the energy travels during one cycle. It's a sinusoidal um, vari variation. You don't really need to know that. There are various equations you can use to um, put into different models, which will allow you to do some sort of calculations very, very simply. Uh, but again, I'm not going to go to any of those. I think the thing to remember is that electromagnetic wave has an electric and a magnetic uh, component and travels at the speed of light, I should add. Um, so when you want to have a transmission uh, to a receiver, um, you want to try and work out what the field strength you're going to get at the receive uh, end is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, to do that, I think this explanation works reasonably well. If you can think about a, a light bulb or something like that, and think of that as being your radio transmitter source. Um, and you turn it on, the light spreads out in all directions. And in fact, over the surface of a sphere, because it's travelling at the same speed in all directions, so it spreads out over a sphere. Um, so if you want to work out what the field strength is, all you really need to know is how much power you sent and what your capture area is. And typically, we, we would use something like either a square metre or a square wavelength uh, as the capture area. And that's the size of your antenna. So the power is spread out over this sphere. If we want to work out what our power flux density, as we call it, is in watts per square metre, all we need to do is work out what the area of that sphere is. And there's a very simple equation um, which gives you the area of the sphere. It's 4 pi r squared. And that's really the basis of the inverse square law and why signals decrease with distance. We often come across a thing called free space loss. Free space loss is not a loss. It's only a loss in the sense that the transmitter power has gone off to bother somebody else. So when you're receiving a signal, um, the energy that you get is just part of it. It's the bit that's been spread out over that area of the sphere. Um, and we define that loss um, usually in decibels, uh, that's what the 10 log 10 is, um, as the ratio of the uh, received power to the transmitted power. 
And there's a very easy way to calculate that number if you actually go through the equations and work out what the surface area of the sphere is um, and um, apply various other things to do with the wavelength and the frequency, you end up with a very simple equation in decibels, which is uh, 92.4 minus 20 log of the distance uh, minus 20 log of the frequency. And that's when you measure the distance in kilometres and uh, the frequency in gigahertz. So a very simple equation will give you the free space path loss. Main problem with this is that, in theory, that's great. In most cases, uh, we're not in free space. So free space is basically being in a vacuum. It's not where we are. We're on the Earth. And the Earth tends to get in the way. So if you want to transmit from a receiver to a transmitter, I hope everyone here believes the Earth is a sphere. Um, therefore, there is a horizon, and you have to get over the horizon. So it, it's how do signals get over the horizon, and that's what I'm going to start talking about. Propagation in real-life situations. So at VHF and above, um, we're mostly concerned with paths that go through the troposphere. That's the lower um, layer of the atmosphere, which extends up to about 10 to 20 kilometres above us. Um, also the effects of terrain and hills and, and that sort of thing, and vegetation, trees, um, and the air. So that bit of atmosphere is particularly strongly influenced by the weather, as we are well aware. Uh, we have rain, we have uh, wind, uh, we have water vapour, we have clouds. All of these things impact the propagation, and that is what is the cause of the anomalous effects. If you think about it, if you're out in the middle of space in a vacuum, nothing ever changes. You'll always get the same signal strength. Whatever you transmit, you'll receive a certain amount, and that won't change. Of course, air is a gas, and gases have impacts on radio signals. It's not a vacuum. Air is made up of mostly nitrogen, 70-odd percent of nitrogen, 21 percent of oxygen, a little bit of argon, um, a small amount of carbon dioxide going up, a bit of helium, neon, krypton. All of those are what we call dry gases. And then there's water vapour. Um, and the concentration of water vapour, that's effectively humidity, that changes with the weather. I say a little bit about what happens. Why do gases impact or attenuate radio signals. Um, what happens is they interact with the electromagnetic field, which is why I mentioned the electromagnetic field in the first place. Um, either they're magnetic um, or they're electric, depending on what the molecule is. Um, water molecules, H2O, will tend to try and align with the electric field. They're asymmetric. And that means they're trying to move. And as they're trying to move, that means they're going to take energy away from the, um, from the wave that's going through. What you get is you get what we call molecular resonance lines. Things, molecules will vibrate at a certain speed, and that will have a, generally will have a strong frequency resonance. So um, this is just a plot of the, what we call the permittivity. Uh, versus, versus frequency. Um, basically, the, the bit with the sharp bit, which we call the imaginary part, and that's just the way the equations work, um, is, uh, is what the loss is. So if your frequency is sitting somewhere near that particular um, part on the, in the spectrum, um, you get a big loss, basically, a big interaction. So the loss you get depends very much on the, on the frequency, the absorption line of the molecule. Of course, it also depends on how much of that gas happens to be there, because as I pointed out earlier, there are various different gases in the atmosphere. Um, water vapour particularly varies a lot. And the most, oh, and of course, how far you're tra actually travelling through this particular gas. Um, so the, the most significant, from our point of view, is radio amateurs are the uh, frequencies from 300 gig up to about 300 gigahertz, which is most bands uh, that we're using, uh, are water vapour and oxygen resonances. This slide 
um, gives a thing we call specific attenuation. That's basically how many decibels you lose per kilometre. So at the lower bands and the lower microwave bands, if you actually look at that scale, and I don't have a pointer here to uh, point it out, but it's uh, if you look at the 5.7, for example, and you look at the loss of water, um, and you look at the loss of oxygen, and you try and add those up together, it's pretty low, 0.001-ish sort of level decibels per kilometre. So you have to go a long, long way before you get any significant loss. And that's, it goes up, basically, as the bands go up. But because of these resonances, it's not, it's not always going up and always going down. So the 24 gigahertz band, for example, which is very close to one of the water resonance frequencies, has a very high loss. Uh, well, when I say very high, it's 0.2 decibels per kilometre. It's not that high uh, for standard uh, atmospheric conditions. But if you've got a 100 kilometre path and you're losing 20 dB, that starts to be a problem. Um, so... What does that mean in practice? And, and the, the attenuation, it does go up with frequency, but uh, the bands are particularly positioned in, in, in places. We don't put a band right at the middle of the great big oxygen peak at 50, um, 57 gigahertz. Um, if it's an oxygen attenuation, you're basically stuck. You have to find somewhere there isn't any oxygen, but that's not particularly useful for radio amateurs. Um, you can do things about water vapour, though, because the amount of water vapour that's in the atmosphere varies uh, with height, and it also varies very much with season, So, if you and, it, and with temperature. So if you can find a very cold, dry day, uh, then that's the time to be making 24 gigahertz DATV DX records. These are just some of the numbers, um, just, to, just to really highlight that point again. Um, so bands like 47 gigahertz um, issue because of the oxygen loss. Um, but up the bands up to that, up to 24 gigahertz, certainly the oxygen loss is pretty small. Um, the, uh, the water vapour in dBs per 100 kilometres, I should say, in this case, um, is, that is variable, but it goes up and down. <clears throat> Next thing I'm going to quickly mention is the ground. Um, terrain getting in the way, hills in, in between you. Yeah. Your transmitter and your receiver. Um, if you launch a radio wave, it, if there was nothing to stop it, it would carry on in a straight line forever, until it or until it hits something. For a transmitter on the ground, that means that if you put power up above the horizon into the sky, that's just going to go off into the sky. It's not going to get anywhere useful. Anything below the horizon is going to carry on merrily until it hits the ground at the horizon. So, oh, and if you point your antenna down, of course, it just goes straight into the ground, maybe a bit of it scatters off, but um, in that particular diagram, we got uh, a somewhat exaggerated earth curvature. It doesn't appear that there's any way of power or signals to get from one place to another if they're not within line of sight each of each other. Uh, actually, it's not quite line of sight. Um, for radio signals, it's actually about four-thirds of line of sight. I'll explain that in a minute. But the distance to the horizon, and this will give you an idea of what your line of sight range is, is uh, 4.12 times the square root of your height. That's the distance that you'll get to your horizon. And, of course, if someone is at the other side of the horizon and they're at a similar height to you, then you'll get twice that. But that's not very far. The horizon is quite close in most cases. <clears throat> but actually, what we get is we get a whole load of atmospheric mechanisms. So we get a thing called refraction, which is bending of signals uh, down towards the ground. We get scattering from things in the air or from, from rain. Uh, and we get diffraction off, uh, off, off the terrain. So starting, starting off with, with diffraction, really. Uh, I'm not going to go into any great detail because the math gets quite horrendous quite quickly when you're looking at diffraction. Um, 
But if you're looking at a thing which, which is what we call a knife edge, which is effectively a very, very sharp cutoff, like you'd have with a very sharp hill, um, if you do a plot of what signal strength you get as you go from line of sight below line of sight so that you can't see the transmitter anymore, this is what happens to the signal. And actually, just as you get to going out of line of sight, you actually get a bit of gain, which is interesting. Um, beyond that, it drops really quite quickly. And the rate at which it drops depends on the frequency. At low frequencies, um, HF, um, it's not so bad. You can get signals to propagate over, over hills. Uh, once you get to VHF, it's not, not as good. And once you get to microwave and uh, UHF uh, frequencies, really, um, you can start to think about terrain as a blocker. Certainly for longer paths, it, it just doesn't, you don't get the diffraction. That's the that's not the way the signal is getting to you. Then refraction, just a quick comment. Does anyone remember Snell's laws? Mm -hmm. How lenses work and prisms and, and that sort of things. So when you have a reflection in a mirror, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Yeah? yeah? So you, know, you look at a mirror and you see yourself coming back. Um, for refraction, it actually depends on the difference of the, of the refractive index and the angle which it comes in, and that's how a lens works. So when you've got your glasses, there, basically you've got some material which is not air, it's glass, and it has a different refractive index, it bends the light way. <laughs> now, the good thing, from our point of view, is the way the atmosphere varies with height. Because as you go up, the pressure drops, there's less gas, and the temperature also falls. And actually, the refractive index of the air reduces as you go up. And the impact of that is that waves get bent downwards, which means they get bent over the horizon. And that's what gives us tropo dx. I said there wasn't going to be much maths. I hope this is not too difficult. <laughs> um, Refractive index is something we, we measure compared to a vacuum. Um, and refractive index is almost always going to be po is always a positive number. But air is almost a vacuum in terms of its refractive index. Um, it's 1.0003, typically, at sea level. Um, that's a difficult uh, number to deal with. So actually what we do is we subtract 1 and multiply it by a million, and that gives us a value of 300, just as a, a number to think about. And then we can actually deal with that in sort of hand-wavy ways rather than talking about the distance between 1.0003 and 1.0031, um, which is actually quite significant. Um, from the propagation point of view, we, we use 300 and 310. Um, there's a fairly simple equation which approximates the refractor, refractivity of air, and that's the equation. Uh, the important bits to note in that is that there's what we call a dry term, which depends only on pressure and temperature, and a wet term, which is where the water vapour is coming in, which um, depends on how much water vapour there is um, in the atmosphere, how humid it is, uh, and also on the temperature. So the dry term and the wet term, and those both vary with space and with time. Um, typically, N is 310 at sea level in the UK, rule of thumb number. So what happens to the refractive index with height? Well, pressure falls exponentially as you go up. Um, up to about eight kilometres, you can basically assume that that's when there's no more pressure from the point of view of doing propagation calculations anyway. Temperature typically falls by about one degree centigrade or so for every 100 metres you go up. Um, water vapour, well, that depends. Um, depends on the weather. There is a limit, though because the air can only hold a certain amount of water, and we know that because when it can't hold that water anymore, it rains, or it forms a cloud, at least, and then it rains. Um, the other interesting point is that once you get below freezing, you can, the, the air can hold very much less water than it can at uh, normal sort of room temperature. Um, so, under typical conditions, there's no water, so to speak, above about three kilometres in altitude um, over the UK. 
Um, so if you want to break the 24 gig DATV record in the UK, all you need to do is find two three <laughs> kilometre high mountains. Um, <clears throat> so good luck with that. Uh, but in some parts of the world, like in the Rockies, in the US, that's a practical proposition. <clears throat> so I should get on with it. Um, the result of all this maths is that the refractive index falls approximately exponentially with height in a, what we call a standard atmosphere. Um, typically by about 40 of these n units per kilometre that you go up. That's what we call normal conditions. And in the bottom um, few hundred metres of the atmosphere, up to about two kilometres or so, you can approximate that as a straight line. As near as makes no difference. <coughs> if the refractive index actually falls, instead of falling by 40, if it falls by more than 157 units per kilometre that you go up, the signal will exactly follow the curvature of the Earth and propagate all the way around the Earth. Of course, that sort of condition never happens, but that's what we call super refraction. And if it falls by less than that, then um, you'll get signals not bending as, as much as normal. And the normal situation in the UK effectively means that the radio horizon is about four thirds, which is a num which number greater than one, about 1.33 times, <coughs> times the actual optical horizon. So you get a bit of propagation beyond the horizon all the time, uh, normal conditions, um, due to this falling refractive index over time. Uh, but of course what we want to know is when do we get super refraction, because that's when things, exciting things start to happen. If you look at the various things that you can twiddle with in that equation, uh, the pressure, well, that's not really a factor because it tends to quickly be restored to an equilibrium by the wind. You don't get huge variations in pressure over short distances. So the most important things are therefore the water vapour and the temperature. Um, and ducts will form either when the temperature is increasing anomalously with height or the water vapour is decreasing unusually rapidly with height. Those are the conditions that lead to ducting and inversions. Um, so, I wrote this presentation a while back. In fact, it was for November. Uh, I think it was for the uh, Martlesham Microwave Roundtable, which was in late November 2006. Um, this goes now back to um, Noel's comment about, I will tell you when you're going to get the next set of good conditions. Because on the 7th of November 2006, I was away. <laughs> now, that generally means that's a good time when I'm away in the autumn to start thinking about having inversions, temperature inversions. So a temperature inversion is where the temperature is doing odd things. So this, is, this graph here, the red line, is showing what the temperature was doing with the height measured by a radio sonde um, on the 7th of November. Um, those people who can remember that far back, we had a mega lift um, on that particular, that particular, I think it was a weekend as well, which makes it doubly annoying. I'm going to say a little bit about ducts now. Um, there are different types of duct. And a duct is, is the case where you've got the refractive index so that the, it's falling by more than 157 N units per kilometre going upwards, which means the energy is getting trapped. It's getting bent back down to, to the Earth. And if you, want to, if you need to get dx, a signal might or it might not couple into that duct. So it very much depends on how deep that duct is and how, how you're located relative to that, um, which means different stations at slightly different altitudes, for example, can end up with very different propagation conditions at times. Not only does it have to couple into the duct, the signal, but it needs to remain in the duct as well. And um, ducts are not uh, perfectly smooth. Um, and they also have a, a particular width, or height, I should say, 
uh, so very low frequencies are basically too big to get into the duct. Um, very high frequencies will get scattered out by the rough edges of the duct. So there is an optimum frequency which will propagate, which just so happens to be UHF. So that, this is why you get ducting more at 70 centimetres than you tend to get at 2 metres. Uh, and it's good at 23 centimetres, but as you go up into the high gigahertz regions, it starts to get uh, less, uh, less common and less depending on what the uh, atmospheric conditions are. But you cannot get a uh, signal to couple into a duct if the angle of incidence is m more than about a degree, because it just doesn't work. Um, in the standard atmosphere, so no ducting, so just these are some ideas of classifications. We have a thing called a surface duct, which is a duct that's following along the surface of the Earth, so um, one end of it is the ground, um, and that means that you will get signals propagating, but um, at some point they'll come into contact with the ground, which is likely to mean that they'll get attenuated or scattered by various things like hills and uh, vegetation, that sort of thing. Um, another type of duct is... Oops. Yeah. Ele that's an elevated layer sur surface duct, I should say. I've missed one out. Um, that uh, is a duct that happens at quite high elevation, but the variation in refractive index at the bottom end of the duct is not enough to stop signals coupling into the ground. Then we've got a, a full elevated duct um, where the duct is completely above the ground, so signals that get trapped in that duct um, will not couple into the ground. And that's interesting because if you happen to be at the, in the ground, underneath where that duct is, you won't see a signal. So you can end up with a situation where signals disappear. Um, and basically, it's going over my head, is most people's argument. Um, and that's what's happening in that case. There's actually also, in that diagram, is a surface duct um, at the bottom of the... Uh, so there's a bit of DX, but local but not the long-range stuff. And there's another interesting thing about a duct, which is if you have a signal which is constrained in that way, where it can't go, it can only move in two dimensions, it can only spread out in distance and horizontally, it can't spread out in three dimensions, that means you no longer get the inverse square law. So you can get signals which are considerably stronger than you would get if it was a free space, if it was propagation in a vacuum. So you can end up with very, very strong signals coming from a very long way away. Um, unfortunately, not very often. Um, this is just another. This is just an example um, of a few uh, of a few ducks, just to show uh, what you can do. Um, there's a set of um, uh, radio sonde stations all over Europe, and you can actually download the data from them, and you can use that to plot. Uh, what the current atmospheric conditions are, and um, Rob uh, M0DTS um, actually plots some of the stations around him um, and puts them on the sort of rolling test card on the GP3KM repeater. So if you have a look at that repeater or look at it on the stream, if it's not within range, uh, that will cycle around and give you an idea of what's going on um, at the moment. These, um, what we call radio sound descents, tend to be done at midday and midnight solar time. So there's not a lot of them, but when you have the sort of conditions that lead to tropo, that's when the atmosphere is most stable. So uh, it's, it's not going to change so quickly over time anyway. Uh, in this particular case, um, the sharp decrease uh, in, in uh, the refractivity with height, which I've sort of circled, um, is, is leading to very strong um, super refraction. And that was the, the 7th of November big lift, basically. And those sites are all over Europe. Hurstmonso is, uh, where is that, Kent somewhere. Essen is uh, in the Netherlands. Nottingham, I think we probably know where that is. And uh, Camborne, I forgot where Camborne is. But uh, Cornwall, yeah, OK. So that was a very widespread event. Um, right, a little bit more about what I was saying earlier about uh, will a duct support a signal? Um, and it depends on your wavelength, effectively. Is it two metres? Is it 70 centimetres? Um, this is really explaining the roughness, which is how much it moves up and down, and ducks tend to follow terrain, um, to, to some extent at least. If they're going over the ground, they'll go over hills and go over mountains and that sort of thing. If you ever look at the Earth 
from the point of view of being high up, it's actually pretty flat. Even, I mean, we, we walk around and we see these big hills, but compared to uh, the atmosphere and the distances that we're propagating radio signals, they're actually quite small obstacles. So if, the, if it's rough, and that roughness is large compared to the wavelength, the energy is scattered out. That effectively means the higher the frequency, the more likely it is to be scattered out. And also, if you're near the ground, if the ground is the lower boundary, energy gets lost to terrain and vegetation. So why are we getting ducts? Um, it's basically the weather, as uh, I've already hinted many times. Um, bits of air are mixed around, moved about, move up and move down, depending on what the weather's doing. Um, the sun shines on the ground, the ground heats up, and that causes thermals and heats up the atmosphere. Um, when it goes dark, the ground cools relatively quickly if it's a clear night. Um, it suddenly gets quite cold. Um, and you can also find that you have areas where there's a lot of water on the ground. You can get evaporation from that water, um, which results in very high humidity gradients, very close to the surface of the water. And that often happens over the North Sea. That's what we call a, a surface uh, sea duct. So evaporation ducts over a large body of water. The humidity gradient is very high, and this is only for a few metres. Um, but if the sea is very calm, then you can propagate using that duct. But if you're high up on a cliff, you might not couple into that duct at all. So it, it's interesting in that it can cause a, a counterintuitive effects as to where you're, where you're located and what sort of signals you get. Uh, temperature inversions, so the, the cold ground at night cools the air Locally, close to the ground, the air above it is warm, and that means temperature is rising with height. That's not normal. Normally, temperature falls with height. Um, if it's dry, the, what we call the dry term dominates, uh, and that leads to super refraction. If it's humid, we tend to get fog, um, which reduces the water vapor density near the cold ground, um, and that means, effectively, you get sub-refraction, which is bad because it kills your signals. Then there's subsidence. Um, this is a, basically to do with pressure regions and um, anticyclones, for example. Uh, descending cold air um, is forced downwards in an anticyclone. Um, and if that air is going down, it's moving from an area of low pressure to high pressure. That means it's being compressed. When you compress a gas, that means it gets warm. So it heats up. Uh, and that means the air as it's descending, it becomes warmer than the air that's down by the ground. And that leaves you to an elevated temperature inversion. Um, typically, maybe one to two kilometres above the ground. Quite common, but most stations are not able to couple into those ducts. Um, but as the anticyclone evolves, uh, the air at the edges of that anticyclone, I carry the air carrying the duct subsides, I get, falls down, and that brings the inversion layer closer to the ground. So and if you're right on the edge of the anticyclone, then you tend to get a lift. Um, and we tend to see that quite often um, in the summer in Europe. Um, that, the other thing is they tend to last for a long time um, on a sort of a continental basis. Then there's advection. That's the movement of air. Or we could just say wind. It's probably an easier way for people to describe what advection is. Um, it's basically warm air, or air that's over the land has got warm uh, in the day when the sun's been um, shining down and the wind blows it out over the sea. Uh, and then it mixes with cooler air, um, which is relatively moist uh, over the sea. Um, and that then means that the evaporation duct, which is always present, actually gets higher. Um, and you end up with a surface duct that's maybe about 100 metres above the height of the sea. Um, the interesting fact is that they don't persist over land. So you don't get these ducts over land, you just get them over sea. So if you're in East Anglia, um, you'll quite often get this sort of duct going over to the Netherlands, to, uh, to Denmark, 
um, that's what's one of the things that's causing those sort of areas to get a lot more ducting than you might get in this part of the world. Um, in the UK, evaporation ducts uh, happen all the time. Um, the widespread duct that forms over the sea to the North UK, that's North Sea UK to Low Countries, that's there quite often. Um, surface ducts are around about 6% of the time, which is more than people might think. <clears throat> they only tend to be up to a 300 metres or so in height and they only cover 100 kilometres or so. Elevated ducts, 7% of the time, up to 3 kilometres in altitude, um, also covering around 100 kilometres or so, typically. Okay, so that's ducting. I'm going to move on to um, rain scatter. Um, so, to make it easier, I've made several gratuitous uh, simplifications. Uh, I've missed out all of the maths. Um, you. When you get, a, if you get a copy of these slides, actually, there is some explanation in the notes, and there are some hidden slides which actually go into some of the maths for those people who uh, like punishment. Um, right, hydrometers. People talk about hydrometers. Basically, it's water in the atmosphere. It's things like rain, snow, hail, fog, mist and clouds, which are ice crystals, by the way. <coughs> um, as far as the radio wave is concerned, though, is there are bits of lossy dielectric suspended in air um, with various different amounts of loss, uh, depending on the temperature, for example. Ice has got very low loss. Liquid water is quite high loss. Um, but what that causes is a distortion of the wave front. Um, and if you've got any distortion of the wave front, that means there must be scattering and that therefore scatters energy. There can also be losses. Um, this is just a, a general interest picture, really, because it's, it's covering um, somewhat more than the uh, radio spectrum, and it's also back to front in terms of the way you would normally think about it, because it's in terms of wavelength. Um, what it's showing is the real part of the refractive index of water and the imaginary part of the refractive index of water and how it varies with frequency. And if you look at the red line, um, the imaginary part, which, as I said earlier, I, but I didn't go into the maths, is what dictates the loss, is exceptionally low in the optical window, which is between about 400 and 700 microns, uh, sorry, nanometers. Can anyone think why that might be the case? Or perhaps that's not the right question. Can anyone think why we call that the optical window? That's what we can see. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So if we saw at 10, 10 nanometers, or if we saw in the... Uh, it, that's in the ultraviolet. Or if we saw in the infrared, actually we wouldn't see as well. We wouldn't see as far. There wouldn't be as much light. So that's why we've evolved, effectively, to see where we see. Um, from the point of view of radio waves, though... Um, it, it goes down quite a lot, um, and I have, this isn't really including a lot of the, uh, the resonances. So um, generally, the loss is quite low. Um, between about 100 gigahertz, it's maybe one. Uh, the, the imaginary part of the refractive index is, is about one, so that doesn't equate to a huge loss. But um, what, it, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to point out here is that um, the loss goes down with frequency. Uh, from, from water. And that feeds into the next comment, which is the attenuation due to rain. Um, rain attenuates microwave signals. Now, this doesn't really have any impact at VHF and UHF, but it certainly does as you move up in the bands. Um, the attenuation is basically you put some power in, you get less out, um, and it's been um, attenuated by some number. Uh, what we actually call the specific attenuation and we measure that in uh, dB per kilometre. I'm not going to go into the maths, as I said, uh, but we can calculate that number from theory. It depends on number of hydrometers or drops, raindrops, for example, in um, a particular volume of sky, how heavy it's raining, in other words, but also how big they are, what their size is relative to the wavelength. Um, now the distribution of rain depends on the climate. So in certain parts of the world, like, say, Manchester, it rains all the time. <laughs> but not at a high rate and not with very large drops. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, like, say, the Amazon rainforest, it doesn't rain so much, but it, when it does, it rains with very big drops, so monsoon-type drops, 
um, are very large. And that actually has an interesting impact in that um, if you were trying to make a, a link to a, a satellite, for example, uh, going straight through the atmosphere um, from the UK, although it rains a lot, the attenuation at higher frequencies is not all that bad. Um, whereas if you go to areas where they have tropical rain, the attenuation can be quite, quite severe. Um, so we're not in such a bad place when it rains all the time, but only a little bit of it, uh, only at a low rate. Um, thunderstorms tend to be the causes of the largest drops, by the way. Um, so scattering, a little bit about scattering. There are three different types of scattering, or, well, there's more, but I'm just going to split into three, which are the, uh, the Rayleigh, the Me, and the, and the optical scattering. And that depends on the size of the particle with relation to the wavelength. Optical scattering, we're fairly familiar with that. That's like a rainbow. Um, so it, it's basically looking like a lens, um, a drop of water. It's important about the terahertz, for example. Um, so if you've got your infrared links or you're doing um, optical um, comms, um, it's important there. Me scattering is when the particle is similar in size to the wavelength. Typical raindrop is maybe a couple of millimetres or so, maybe up to five millimetres in heavy rain. So that's really up in the 50 and 60 gigahertz sort of range and above. It's rather complicated to model. And then there's Rayleigh scattering, which happens when the wavelength is, is significantly larger than the particle. And that's mostly what we get. Uh, it's called Rayleigh scattering because a chap called Rayleigh wrote a paper about it. Um, it's scattered in the form of a dipole antenna. And uh, the amount of scattering is proportional uh, to the diameter of the particle cubed divided by the wavelength. One of the problems, which is one of the things I've added to this uh, presentation, one of the few things I added actually, is that the signals aren't very coherent. So 10 gigahertz rain scatter tends to sound a bit like an aurora. Um, I don't think it's going to be much good for QPSK. Um, maybe some DVB-T might be able to make use of that sort of um, scattering, but probably not the higher rate stuff. Uh, a little bit about rain attenuation. Um, it's specific attenuation again. That's rain loss in decibels per kilometre travelled through the rain. Um, main point about this is that actually below 10 gigahertz, unless it's raining really, really, really heavily, you can forget about it. It's only above 10 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz and above that we really need to worry about that. And um, once you get above about 100 gigahertz, then it tends to level off in terms of the, the loss doesn't really go up anymore with frequency. Uh, the um, attenuation for horizontally polarised signals, by the way, tends to be slightly higher um, than the vertical attenuation. And the reason for that is because raindrops are that sort of shape. They're not round things, and they're definitely not things that look like teardrops. Um, so they're bigger in the horizontal dimension than the vertical dimension, and therefore they cause more attenuation to horizontally polarised signals. So if you're trying to do your DX record at 24 gigahertz, you might want to switch to vertical. Um, a very simple model here, um, again there's a whole load of maths hidden, but this is calculating what um, sort of signal uh, you might receive uh, via rain scattered signal compared to line of sight. That's slightly unfair in that um, you might not have line of sight between you and the receiver, but you might, have line of, you might both have line of sight of the rain, and that's how you're getting rain scatter. And if you go through the maths and you do the calculations, um, the bands that give the best rain scatter are the higher frequency ones. Um, and I think the sweet spot, uh, because of the, also the increase in attenuation, is probably about 24 gigahertz. So 10 to 24 gigahertz is the sweet spot for uh, rain attenuation, uh, rain um, scatter rather. I've included in that the loss that you get because generally when you have rain scatter, you're also going to get rain attenuation because you're going to be, the signal's going to be travelling at least to some extent through a bit of rain. Okay, right, getting towards the end. Um, the normal modes of, mode of propagation is what we call troposcatter. Um, that's what gives us our anytime DX uh, non-line of sight paths up to a few hundred kilometres. That's, um, that's what most contacts are made by, probably is tropospheric scatter. Um, the cause of it is that air is not uniform, so um, we have turbulence in the atmosphere. 
Um, and wherever you've got turbulence and you've got slightly different levels of water vapour and slightly different temperatures and slightly different pressure, then you can get scattering of wave, of wave, uh, of wave fronts. Um, ed you get eddies in the atmosphere, basically, with scales of a few hundred metres, um, but those cause smaller eddies and etc. and you end up down to about a millimetre or two, at which point then it all sort of disappears into, uh, into normality again. So um, the scale length is actually important because it um, gives you an idea of what sort of frequencies are likely to be scattered uh, most by tropospheric um, troposcatter. Uh, there's um, a spectrum, uh, Kolmogorov spectrum, um, which actually says that the slope is going to be proportional uh, to the turbulence factor to the power minus 11 sixteenths. <laughs> yeah. Now the reason. <laughs> The reason for putting this slide again will be apparent if you look at the, uh, the more detailed slides, but it actually tries to explain why um, the frequency variation is as it is. But back exactly almost the same as rain, but now think of this as changes in refractive index in the air because of the temperature and pressure. The wave front gets scattered by small angles and defocused. That means some of that energy is usefully scattered. Um, beyond the horizon, and if your transmitter and receiver are both looking at the same bit of air where the signals are being scattered from, uh, you'll get signals that go beyond the horizon. And this is the, the concept of the common volume. Um, generally, it, um, you would think about this when you're using big dishes, but it does apply to Yagi antennas as well. Um, typical value. Uh, on two meters, um, about minus 145 dB, including the antenna gain between transmitter and receiver. <coughs> if it was line of sight, you'd only have 80 dB, but the point is it's not line of sight in, in most cases. So uh, tropos scatter signals are maybe 65 dB down um, on line of sight. And what does that tell you? It tells us that we need to do something about the 25 watt ERP limit for um, DATV on two metres, um, because this mode is always there. So if we want to break uh, the uh, 250 kilometre, uh, well, not break, receive the 250 kilometre prize, um, then it would help uh, if we could use a bit more power. OK, so just a few examples, really, of, uh, of what the trapper scatter path losses are. Um, for a 60 centimetre dish, I was thinking about this from the point of view of your typical microwave station um, to get, get non-line of sight paths. Um, <clears throat> the important point, though, I think to make in this is that <coughs> although troposcatter goes above the horizon, uh, the loss increases very dramatically as the angle goes up. So if you, um, if you have a very high terrain angle, you're not going to do very well with troposcatter. So it's really good to have a low horizon um, when you're trying to make DX records, which is why people on hills still do quite well. OK, that's just another example for 100 kilometres rather than 200 kilometres. And that's uh, 250 kilometres. And that's 500 kilometres. OK, so that pretty much covers what I was going to say um, about introducing the fundamentals. Um, of course, no, you don't really need to bother with any of this because the software available which will tell you what's going to happen. Um, this is just an example of my path profile software, which gives you an idea of what the point-to-point -point, uh, path loss is likely to be between two points, and it gives you some statistics. It doesn't do real-time propagation. Uh, there are other packages around which will do some real-time real prediction based on the weather forecast of what, uh, what a particular path is going to be able to achieve. Um, so have a look at various different bits of software uh, if you've got more interest, it's nice to understand what's behind the mechanisms, but uh, in, in practice, um, you can just put your two locations or more locations into a program and get some idea. <coughs> uh, I already mentioned that, well, we know terrain and the weather are the things that influence propagation. 
Um, there's lots of data that's been collected over many, many years, which has fed into uh, statistical models from the uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. There are lots of recommendations in the literature, um, which are generally designed to be ones that can be done on the back of an envelope without having to think too hard. So uh, they are usable by amateurs. Um, and, of course, quite a lot of them have now got software implementations as well. Um, you can get maps of terrain. You don't need to uh, go out and look. You can find out what the terrain's like uh, from uh, the US Geographical Service. Um, and uh, if you want to work out what the current refractivity conditions are, what the current state of the atmosphere is to see if there might be any ducts about, you can get them from the University of Wyoming, who uh, collate all the data from all over the world. Um, you can tell I did this in 2006 because back then this was quite new and unusual. There was no Google Earth uh, as such. Um, high resolution terrain height data is needed for planning your links. You need to know where the hills are. Um, it's now available for the whole world. Um, there's the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, which is a space-based measurement, uh, entirely passive. Um, which gives you, I think, down to three arc seconds. That's about uh, 90 meter resolution um, points over the globe. And there was a um, SRTM, Shuttle Radar to Tomography Mission, uh, which gives you things one to three arc seconds, so that's 30 to 90 meter resolution. So that will give you some information about uh, where you can get that. Uh, so the final comment, don't ask me where, just Google it. That's the easiest way to find these things. So that was it. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, do, we, do we have any questions? <coughs> well, uh, over scatter effects, if I can give you an example back from when the days of analog TV, and if we go, that used to get some sun being in Bristol, I used to sort of come to on usually most days pick up ghosts and Dutch ghost transmitter, which used to flash up for no apparent reason. Mm. Well, that, that's scatter, that would be, would it? That. Probably. I mean, yeah. well, I haven't, this is all natural stuff. Yeah. So there's also very much scatter from things like aircraft. Yeah, that could be a possible case with, with, with some of it. Have to, the docks are also selective, whereas a station that's near don't get picked up, but ones that are a lot more different. Yeah, they, they, can, they can be quite localised. Yeah, yeah or in a, in a effective light. The duct would bypass anything or not near there. Yeah, this is when it's elevated, it's gone over the top effectively of, yeah. of the other people, or they can't couple into it because the angles are wrong. So, uh, the radio sun data, I mean, there's only a limited amount around the country. I mean, mm. is that good enough? You know, surely we need lots of well, it to it be could, able to. Yeah, it could be better, but it's not bad. Right. And actually, that's not the only source of data now. Radio suns give you data by actually measuring it where they are. Uh, but there are lots of stations that are using GPS now to measure not just the um, troposphere, but also the ionosphere. So what it, as well as you get delay basically caused by the refractive index as well, because it, it, that's what it is, it, the light's travelling slower. And by triangulating against lots of different satellites and knowing where you are exactly and knowing where they are exactly, you can work out what the excess path is and you can work out using that a gradient through the atmosphere yeah. of, uh, of the refractive index and also the uh, ionosphere and the total electron content, which is useful for HF propagation prediction. Great. OK, well, uh, one more question and then we must move on. Thank you. Um, obviously, uh, water in the atmosphere is quite a significant um, factor in determining where the ducting takes place. I've heard it said, I've read somewhere, that if the atmospheric pressure reaches 1,033 millibars and then starts to fall, that's a good warning that ducting is likely to come about. Do you know anything about that? And can you tell us anything, whether that's true or just a rumour? or? Well, if you, you could put that into the equation and see what, uh, what yeah. impact that would have. But I would have thought it would also depend on the temperature and how much water vapour there is. Um, I mean, presumably but you do the tend pressure, to get ducting associated with high pressure and 100, 
Well, that's about standard atmospheric pressure, actually. No, 1033. Yeah, it's only a little bit above standard, isn't it? Because standard... You'd think standard was 1,000, but it's not, is it? 1,013 is standard, 1013. Isn't it? So it's a yeah. bit higher, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've not uh, heard of that. No, OK. OK, and we've had uh, one question on the stream. Just a very quick explanation of why ice is lower attenuation than water. Um, well, I'd have to go into quite a lot of detail to explain, to explain that, uh, but it, it's to do with the fact that it's a crystal and it's frozen and it's not a liquid anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Mike.